folding over. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to buy lots of hand dice. You just. Is it better now? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah it looks good. Okay. One, one testing. Yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, testing uh, this one. All right, so I think it's time to start. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Lucas uh, Guskos today. He got his PhD from University of Athens some time ago, and then he uh, had a postdoc at uh, UCSB, uh, Santa Barbara on the West Coast. Then he crossed the Atlantic again, went to Soren first as a fellow, that's kind of like a postdoc position at Soren, and then he was uh, hired as a research assistant, which is a long duration position and uh, through his career he was uh, actually very interested in developing machine learning and artificial intelligence applications for particle physics and today he is going to talk about how they work in the Higgs physics. Thank you very much Greg for the very nice introduction. It's my pleasure to be here and um, I will talk about uh, how we push the frontiers in uh, Higgs physics using artificial intelligence. And I'm going to focus in two, uh, in two uh, topics, uh, like how we use this development to measure the Higgs charm coupling and also the Higgs square production. So to set the scene, one of the best tools we have actually to probe the early universe is high energy particle colliders. So, by colliding particles, actually, we are uh, recreating the conditions of the, that existed uh, very early after the uh, Big Bang. The higher the collision energy, the more closer we go to the beginning of the universe. And uh, currently, we are probing the region which corresponds to something like 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. The best theory we have to describe, to understand the building blocks of the universe is the standard model of physics. Standard model that descri describes the, the interactions at macroscopic scales of fast moving particles. So it's a, it's a theory that combines quantum mechanics and special relativity. And there are two components here. The first component has to do with the particles. So we have the matter particles, we have quarks, we have leptons, three, three families, three generations. Actually, the stable matter consists of the first generation of, uh, of fermions of matter particles. We have also the force particles, the Z and W, which are the mediators of the weak uh, uh, force, the photon, the mediator of the electromagnetic uh, force, and the gluons, they are the um, mediators of the strong force. And then we have a second uh, component, which are the interaction between all these particles. Now, the cornerstone of the standard model is the Higgs boson that we discovered uh, a decade ago uh, at CERN. And uh, this uh, boson actually should be playing a very special role, interact with all uh, particles. And you know, if new particles exist, new interactions should be 
also maybe related, maybe interacts, maybe couples with the um, new particles. Now, the reason actually that we build LHC, or one of the biggest reasons that we build the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, was to discover the Higgs boson. So the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC is located at CERN. You can see here the lake of the Geneva, the airport, and the white lines here are different accelerators. So this, for instance, is the SPS. It's where the W and Z bosons were discovered around uh, 40 years ago. They have mass 100, around 100 times the mass of the proton. In this larger circle, this is the LHC tunnel. It has a perimeter of 27 kilometers. And 10 years ago, we discovered the, the Higgs. And there are four big experiments. Alice, Atlas, LHCB, and CMS. This, uh, uh, Atlas and CMS are the two general purpose experiments. I'm working in CMS, and this is a picture uh, from, of the detector uh, inside the cavern. Currently, we're in the third data taking uh, period of the LHC, and we are colliding uh, protons at the center of vast energy of 13.6 tera electron volts. Concerning the compact neon solenoid, the CMS detector is compact. It's uh, almost half the size of the Atlas detector. It's heavy, weighs almost two times more than the other detector. So it's actually heavier even than the Eiffel uh, Tower in Paris. The central feature of the CMS detector is the four Tesla solenoid. And inside the solenoid, we have closer to the beam pipe, the tracking system, the pixels and the, and the tracker. Then inside the magnetic field, we have the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadronic calorimeter. And outside the solenoid, we have the neon system. For the, for the event reconstruction, actually, we combine information from all subdetectors. And we provide a mutually exclusive list of particles, like photons, uh, electrons, electrons charged and neutral hadrons, and also muons that transverse the entire detector. You can see the heat patterns here. And using these particles, we build more complicated objects, like, for instance, jets. Like. So jets, like quarks and gluons, they carry color, so interact via the strong force. And because of confinement, they cannot be isolated. So they have to hadronize, they create hadrons, and uh, so they, they create uh, colorless uh, states. So phenomenologically, a jet looks like a spray of particles in the vicinity around the, in the vicinity of the initial quark and glue. Experimentally, how we reconstruct jets actually is we cluster the particles or energies on, in the detector with an algorithm that clusters. We start with a more energetic. Uh, uh, particles and clusters of the particles around. And this you see an example of a two-jet event at the LHC with this characteristic uh, uh, set. Now, since the discovery of the Higgs boson, we enter a new uh, era now. We can uh, consider actually the LHC as a Higgs factory. So here are the four main production modes of the Higgs uh, production, which is the dominant here by far, the uh, gluon-gluon fusion, the vector boson fusion, the Higgs in association with the W or Z boson, or in association with the TT bar, with the top uh, pair. And to get a feeling about the numbers we're talking about, uh, during the second run of the LHC, we produced around 7 million, a bit more than 7 million Higgs. So we produce effectively a Higgs every second. And just to understand actually the challenges we are facing, some of the important backgrounds, we have two orders of magnitude more TT bar. Uh, background and many, many orders of magnitude more uh, background from uh, quantum chromodynamics, like quarks and gluons. And concerning the decay, having a Higgs uh, at 125 GeV, this opened up a very rich uh, phenomenology. The most dominant decay mode is in a pair of B quarks here. We can have uh, also in a pair of W bosons, Zs, also in gluons, but it's very, it's impossible to discover it since we have gluons, a lot of background in a, in a Hadron Collider. Now, uh, there are two ways actually to discover the Higgs. This is why we're doing all this, to understand how the universe works. So there are two main ways. If we have uh, a new particle and uh, the mass 
is within the reach of the LAC. One approach is to uh, carry out direct searches to observe these particles. Another uh, route to follow is actually to see, to carry out sensitive tests of the standard model, for instance, measure properties of the Higgs, and look for deviations. And here I show an example how, for instance, some um, new physics models, for instance, this is supersymmetry, so this is one of the most studied uh, extensions of the standard model, how they can modify, for instance, the coupling, the interaction of the Higgs to tau leptons and Higgs to bottom quarks. So the, the, each point corresponds to a different model, different uh, configuration of supersymmetric masses. The darker colors corresponds to, oh, uh, oops, sorry, my screensaver, uh, that are excluded by direct uh, search for supersymmetry. The lighter colors are those that are still, uh, uh, are not excluded. And you see the modifications that they can cause to the interaction of the Higgs with tau's and bottoms. So if it's standard model, is that one. Deviations from one mean, uh, uh, values uh, away from one means modification due to supersymmetry. And this circle here gives actually what is the, uh, the current uncertainties we have in these two uh, couplings. Another way actually is also to modify the Higgs kinematics. And these are some models. For the black line corresponds to the momentum of the Higgs boson uh, without new physics. And the other colors correspond to modifications on the momentum of the Higgs for different scenarios. And you can see they can be very striking, particularly at uh, high uh, Higgs boson momentum. So the discovery of the Higgs boson is not the end of the story. Actually, the contrary, it opened up a whole new chapter of exploration and the experiment actually exhaustively studying the Higgs boson, both Atlas and CMS. Now, let me give you where we stand now. So, uh, currently, already actually in run one, since run one, the first data taken period of the LHC, we established interaction of the Higgs boson with the force particles, with Ws and Zs, and also photons and, and gluons. And with the, the data collected, including the data collected in the second run of the LHC, we established interaction with third generation fermions, with top quarks and bottom quarks, with tau leptons, and okay, the neutrinos uh, is a different story, it's out of the game. So we have a perfect uh, score box. And usually, how we organize this, we use this plot that has the particle mass here and the coupling strength on the, on the y-axis. The dashed line is, is the theory, what we expect from standard model. And you see, actually, we have a perfect, impressive agreement over, this is log scale, right? Over several orders of magnitude. And you see the ratio here, so this looks very impressive. So the next step actually is to go to second generation. This is more challenging, either that the, either the branch generation is smaller or the final state is more challenging to reconstruct at the, at the Hadron Collider. And uh, we already have some uh, excitement, exciting results. For instance, in the case of uh, cu the, the coupling of the Higgs to a pair of muons, this is an example, an event display, an actual event. The two red lines are two muons coming from the Higgs, where the Higgs is produced in association with a W boson that decays to a lepton and a neutrino, which is actually will infer the neutrino from the, uh, from the imbalance in the momentum in the transverse plane. And what we do, we plot the invariant mass of the two muons. This is shown on the x-axis here. The y-axis shows a number of events. And, uh, and all the white things, the background, you don't see any excess. But if you remove the background and go down here in the lower panel, you see that st something start popping up here around 125 GeV, which is the mass we expect to be since it's at 125 GeV. And we quantify uh, this excess in terms of sigma, so effectively, this is three sigma, three standard deviation. It means that how probably this success to be, to come from a fluctuation of the background. So it's, a, it's per mil less. And this consists an evidence of Higgs coupling second generation lepton. And also the rate that we see is consistent with the rate that we expect from standard model. So signal strength means the ratio of the observed rate over the rate that we expect from standard model. So, we are getting there, the Higgs to mean mu, to two muons. The other challenge is to go after uh, Higgs, uh, to measure the Higgs charm coupling. 
So this is maybe impossible, it was not even a dream many years ago, and for two main reasons. First of all, we are talking about the Hadron, we have a Hadron Collider, so we have lots of jets, we have huge backgrounds, very complex backgrounds, and also the charm identification is much more challenging than uh, the identification. So it's, it's quite challenging, but actually we often exceed the expectations. And this is a copy from a text w w from the Atlas te Technical Design Report back in 1999. Long story short, it was hopeless to see Higgs coupling to bottom quarks at the LHC. And the sentiment was very similar also in CMS. But uh, 20 years after, just using, using part of the RAN2 data, we have observation by both Atlas and CMS experiments of Higgs uh, decaying to a pair of blue quarks. Now, as I said, critical actually to, to, to measure Higgs to charm quarks is the jet identification. So what I'm saying jet, as jet identification or tagging is to identify the flavor of the elementary particle that initiated the jet. And focusing more on the Higgs side, we have two approaches, either reconstruct the decay product as two distinct uh, jets or the two charms in a single uh, jet. I will focus more on this part, but to large extent, uh, techniques and, and tools developed for this approach are also and are used also in this uh, uh, case. So if we want to, to tag uh, bottom and charm quarks, first of all, we exploit the fact that they have large lifetime. So it means that the travel the detector, the travel the emitter and the detector, and this translates to uh, displaced vertices with respect to the primary vertex, the vertex of the collision. We see displaced tracks, so we exploit these features. We also have harder fragmentation, and also in the case that they decay leptonically, we, we, we use, we look for, for a, a non-isolated uh, uh, lepton. Another very powerful handle that we have is to, to check the energy flow, the energy patterns inside the, the jet. For instance, if we have quarks or gluons, this is a single prong. If we have a Higgs, decays to two particles, we look for two prongs. We have a top quark that decays to a B and uh, there is a question. Yes. Yeah. A few millimeters depends on the momentum. Yeah. Right. So, so or even more can go centimeters. Yeah. What can you resolve in terms of those kinds of positions? The resolution that we have is much better than a millimeter. The, 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 the so right, right. Yeah, it's yeah, so okay. yeah. Thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's 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 yeah, it's much larger the distance than the uncertainty we have in the measurement. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and the other one is the mass, right? If you have a Higgs and you reconstruct all the uh, particles, uh, you expect the, jet, the mass of the jet to be around the, the mass of the Higgs. For lighter quarks and gluons that consist background in this uh, analysis, you expect the mass to be very close to zero. But the beginning, it was unclear what are the correlations exist between these variables. So in the early days, we were uh, designing algorithms that uh, based on human-inspired high-level observables, and then we're applying some uh, selection, cutoff selection on this variable, or we use them as input to some simple, shallow machine learning. But what changed the game, actually, was uh, to move to lower-level information. And the reason is that the decay products of the Higgs are so collimated that it's very difficult to identify patterns there. So using high-level variables was making uh, suboptimal. So we use actually the particles that are returned by the, the, the event reconstruction that we have, and then the, and as inputs to deep uh, learning algorithms. And then the next question is how to represent the effect. So now an idea at the beginning was to treat the detector as a camera and then the jet as an image. And you see an example here of a Higgs decaying to a pair of charm quarks, how the, does it look? But there are some uh, limitations here. First of all, you see all this white means, so here is actually uh, the rapidity, the azimuth, and the color in its pixel shows the energy of this uh, pixel. 
but there is some limitation. You see all this white here means that actually we are, um, we are using computing resources to process zeros, right? The other thing is that, okay, this may work for calorimeters, but as I showed at the beginning, the detectors we have tracking, et cetera, they are very heterogeneous. So it's not straightforward how one can include the, the information here. And uh, another more natural representation is to represent the jet as a sequence of particles and then including more information, more properties, more features is much more straightforward. So this allows us to exploit the full granularity of the detector and also the potential of event reconstruction. And as I said, that was a game changer. If you compare the performance, you usually compare the performance in terms of receiver operating characteristic curves, rock curves. So let's let, let, let me take a few seconds just to describe this quickly. On the x-axis, we have the signal efficiency. In this case, the efficiency to reconstruct correctly uh, a Higgs boson decay into a pair of charm quarks. On the y-axis, the fake rate, the mystical rate, right? So the, the better algorithm is the lower and on the right side of this plot. And the red line corresponds to the previous algorithms with high level information, simple machine learning, and this is the new one with low level information. And you see that actually we can achieve for the same signal efficiency and background rejection by more than an order of this magnitude. So this was really uh, a game changer. But we can do better. So inspired uh, on techniques that, uh, for instance, Google does for self-driving cars or in robotics, we uh, were, you know, a very active area of in machine learning communities to use the notion of point clouds. So effectively, you represent every object as an unordered set of points, right? The car, for instance, is a set of points. Or another example that may be even more representative is, let's say, you have an airplane and we represent it as a, as, a, as a point cloud, then what we do, we, def we design an algorithm, usually <coughs> using advanced machine learning, that groups points based on the similarity. So let's say that we want to identify the wings of the plane. This point that you see with um, these yellow colors are close, are grouped together because they are relevant for this specific task. For instance, to identify the wings of the plane, the engines that are closer in spatial coordinates are not so relevant for this task, so they are far away in this uh, abstract space. And so you see where I'm going. So we moved actually from particle sequence to particle cloud. We represent the jet as a cloud, as a cloud of particles. Then we, to, to, to process efficiently this information, we move to graph neural networks. So you can think as a graphing computer uh, science. So uh, the particles are the vertices of the graph, and relationships between the particles are the connections of the graph. And then since we have the graph, we have to learn from the graph. And for this, we follow a hierarchical learning approach. First, we focus on local features, and then we move gradually to more global ones. And this was another major step. So this is the previous based on particle sequence. This is with using particle net. This is the algorithm that uh, uses the particle, the notion of particle of point cloud. And we have another factor of four improvement in background rejection for the same signal efficiency. Or if you want to see it differently, for the same background uh, rate, Mr. Great, we gain around 20% in signal efficiency, X to CC tagging efficiency, which actually this is uh, similar to run the LHC for one extra year. So effectively we save money. And the cool thing is actually that the gain that we see here translates also in data. This is uh, on the y-axis is, is the ratio of the efficiency of the performance effectively we see in data over in Monte Carlo. And you see this is very, it's at one. So it means that all these things we have in simulation work also in data. And this concept actually of particle net was applied in many other applications in LHC and also in non lhc now, going back to physics analysis. So this is uh, the search for um, uh, Higgs uh, decaying to a pair of charm quarks, targeting the associated production of a Higgs with a vector boson. This is work uh, we did very closely and uh, work very closely and had very strong collaboration with the CMS uh, group here at Brown. So here we target the topology because um, on this part, on the, on the W or Z boson, if we uh, look only for decays that the, this boson decay electronically, we kill the overwhelming QCD background. 
and then we focus on the on the on the X part. And given, and this is actually what we are looking for. So here is, for instance, a Z boson decaying to a pair of muons, and this is a Higgs candidate. So this is a Higgs, and the, these orange ones are the charm uh, quarks, charm jets, and even this one decays semi-leptonically. You have this muon here, which is the strong string that is of the non-isolated muon, which is the strong string that this is the this is the charm. So, uh, and because this, this, this is a very challenging, we want to exploit as much as possible the Higgs decay topology. So we, fall, we, we carry out two approaches. The one, the resolved jet, we say, focuses more on the lower part of the momentum of the, of the Higgs, and uh, which is, gives access to the larger uh, signal acceptance. And, uh, but okay, one has to buy with more backgrounds. In the merge jet, uh, we focus on higher momenta, which gives a better uh, signal purity, but on the other hand, the signal acceptance drops uh, faster. But for the final result, we combine both uh, topologies. I'm going to discuss a bit more about this topology, very briefly, just some highlights. One thing is, uh, okay, even with all this effort that we put to suppress the backgrounds, uh, uh, with particle net, et cetera, we still have a very large and complex, uh, we, we remain with very large and complex background against a very small uh, signal. So we have to do to discriminate even further. And for those, we use machine learning. But on the other hand, since we are talking about a very tiny signal, we have to keep the systematic uncertainty under control. And this we had in mind when we designed the event level discriminant. So here is an example of the discriminant lower values are more uh, background dominated. The main background is uh, WLZ bosons and uh, CC bar backgrounds. On higher values is more signal enhanced. And just to give you a, a, a tip on how we design this uh, discriminant, it's actually allowed us to calibrate the algorithm in situ. And this had an effect of reducing by around 30% uh, total uh, systematic uncertainty. Then the other thing, the other challenge we have is actually how to precisely estimate the background. These are very complex backgrounds. So we, we use a data-driven approach. So we define dedicated control regions in data. We measure the main process there. We extract corrections and we transfer these corrections to the signaling regions to correct uh, for the final prediction. You see in this plot here, this is an example from one of the signal regions. The solid histograms are the backgrounds after correcting them from the dedicated control regions. The black market are the data, the observed data. And this shows a very uh, excellent agreement between data and prediction. And as I said, the last step is actually to extract the signal. So what we do here, we combine the two topology and we look for an excess in data compatible with, compatible with Higgs DCC. Of course, this is very small now. Currently, this is, uh, we don't expect uh, to have significant signal. So what we do is actually we, we, we set limits on the maximum possible uh, rate allowed by the data. And just one step before we actually carry out, because we use very advanced techniques here, we want to be extra careful that everything we put in place uh, really uh, work in data. And we have a very, an excellent candle here. We can measure, we can use, instead of Higgs decaying to a pair of charm, use the Z decay to a pair of charm quarks. They are very, apart from the mass and some difference in the spin, they are very similar processes. And actually we validated all the details of the analysis by measuring the Z decaying to a pair of charm quarks. And actually, as you see here, uh, the, the rate is, is textbook. I mean, the, the, the rate that we uh, predict is consistent with uh, what we observe. And also, this came as a bonus because this is the first observation of Z to decay into a pair of charm quarks at a Hadron Collider. And the, the excess is almost six uh, sigma. And after this very successful test, we unblinded the Higgs mass window. This is the combination of the two topologies and we extract a signal of around uh, eight times the standard model value, but very large uncertainty. The signal is very small, so it's consistent with the standard model expectations. 
and we use this result to set uh, limits in the production of this uh, process, the limits that we have, the expected is uh, better than eight, the observed is 14, and for comparison, actually, the atlas, our colleagues from the other side of the ring, has an expected of 31, we are four times better than atlas, and uh, this is thanks to improvements that we have in the analysis design on the z tagging, etc. And this we can also translate constraint, constraints on the coupling, that actually the expected one is uh, around three times the sta standard model value, which this number was expected to be achieved by at the end of high luminosity LAT with more than an order of magnitude more data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, then. What you mean the, what does the lower bound on an upper limit mean? So the fact that because the, the expectation is one, right, from standard model. The expectation is one. But yes, you, you got but more than there one. is there is some room, you know, here there is some room to this is a signal strength, right? The upper limit on the signal strength. So we fit how much signal the data could fit, and this gives us an uncertainty at sixty-eight percent and ninety this is the confidence level effectively, sixty-eight percent and ninety-five percent what we, the, the expectation to lie within there. So in principle, I mean, this doesn't have to be, it's, it's an upper limit on the signal strength, but. No, well, yeah, well, not with this, uh, in this confidence level, no. I mean, yes. The, we have the likelihood, but then if you, if you if you go to higher uh, yeah, more there, of course you can be one, yes. And uh, and actually we use this analysis to extrapolate to what we expect at the end of the high luminosity LT. You see this we simultaneously extract the constraint of the peak to bottom coupling, peak to time coupling, and you see actually that we start probing standard model values for uh, fixed term coupling, right? That was really a major step forward. And of course, if we want to do a very precise uh, measurement, we have to go far future in the plus minus collider there we can uh, have an uncertainty of 3% on the signal strength. Now, and just to give you a, a feeling about the progress, so five years ago, the limits on this, the upper limit on the, on the signal strength were ten, on the order of 10,000. And five years with all this development, we actually have, uh, we improved by four orders of magnitude. And if one extrapolates, as I said, you know, go close to standard model values, with more improvement, with more adding additional uh, production modes, et cetera, we may have a first evidence of uh, high luminosity, actual high luminosity, if Atlas also used this technique. Um, so this looks quite exciting. Now, uh, moving to the last part of the talk, I mean, these developments are not only relevant for measuring the heat term coupling, but also for many other topics. And one, this is actually one of the big, big goals, the, maybe the ultimate goal of the LAT and the high LAT, high, high luminosity LAT physics programs to measure the heat set coupling, right? And this is very, very important because it can allow us to understand how the electroweak symmetry broke in the early universe. It can, if there is connection between the mass generation mechanism and the asymmetry that we have between matter and antimatter. So it's really a very, very fundamental thing. And in order to understand this, we have to uh, know how, what the Higgs potential, right? If it's standard model, this usual Mexical hat that you see on the left, or that if it's new physics, this will change. If, if this is the global minimum or there's another minimum, if we are in a stable or metastable universe, etc. So to measure this, we need to, uh, we need to, uh, to answer these things, we need to learn, I mean, to measure the Higgs potential. And currently, with the Higgs mass, we know very well at per mil level this part here, but uh, if we want to, to get the full shape, we need to go to the third derivative. And this boils down to measuring actually the Higgs self-coupling. So this is a big priority of the physics program. And direct access to the uh, Higgs self-coupling we have by um, uh, di-Higgs production. 
right? In the, in the dominant production mode in gluon, gluon fusion, we have these two diagrams, the triangle one and the box one. The triangle one is the one that is relevant for fixed edge coupling. And you see on the right plot with red, this is the triangle one, how is the distribute the invariant mass distribution of the two Higgses. The blue one is the box here, but there is an interference between them. So the black one is what we see in our data. And given that they have different kinematics, I forgot to mention that this is actually assuming that there is standard model value for the three linear couplings here. And uh, we, we can disentangle the contributions and, and, and measure effectively the lambda here, the three linear couplings. But this is challenge, right? If Higgs was challenging, this is actually even more challenging, even more rare. It's actually uh, three, uh, it's a thousand times more rare than a single Higgs. So we produce around 4K, 4,000 uh, Higgs pairs during lamp two. Now moving to the experimental signatures, these are the, the final stage that we can have. We have two Higgs bosons. They can decay both of them to a pair of B. So if you go higher, this gives uh, access to the larger branch three ratio. But uh, the final state are not so clean. We have many jets. On the right here, for instance, if you have photons, there are much cleaner final states, but uh, actually the, the, the branch ratio is, is tiny here. So there is no like a golden channel that we had in the case of the Higgs, where the Higgs decay to Gs and or photons. So we explore, we have a very comprehensive uh, set of analysis exploring multiple decay modes. But nevertheless, the most sensitive channels, as you see here on the plot on the right, at least one of the Higgs bosons decays to a pair of B quarks, right? And this gives a good compromise between signal purity and acceptance. And clearly, since it decays to a pair of Bs in a hadron collider, jet tagging is critical. And um, one analysis that actually for Andrew drives the sensitivity is the analysis that both Higgses decay to a pair of B quarks and also targets the high PT region where the Higgs bosons are high PT, high momentum, they are boosted as we say, so both B quarks can be contained to a single jet. And you see in here in event display, we have two uh, jets, <coughs> each contain a pair of B uh, quarks inside. And uh, and the advantages of these uh, topologies, first of all, that we have improved signal purity and re reduced combinatorial backgrounds. But the additional challenge going to a, a all B final state is actually we have to, how to estimate the backgrounds and we follow a data-driven approach. And to extract the signal, actually we fit the mass of the jet. And I saw an example here, the solid histogram again are the predictions, black mark is the data. And this red one is the, one of the Higgses decaying to a pair of B. And the agreement between data and simulation is, is excellent here. Also, so, so, but still we are far from uh, measuring the Higgs uh, self-coupling and we use these results to set again upper limit. We follow the same technique as described earlier in the case of Higgs charm. And um, so uh, one thing, now we, we set a limit that is four times the standard model, expected six times observed. You see with all these developments in jet identification, the all B final state drives the sensitivity in this <coughs> channel. Compared to Atlas, we have a factor of two improved sensitivity. Atlas has a eight expected, we have four. And uh, we use this to set constraints on the, on the values of self-coupling. Kappa shows how the modification on the, on the Higgs self-coupling compared to the standard model value with the, the coupling over the coupling predicted by the standard model. And again, these are very uh, uh, strong results that actually are comparably what we expect in this channel for high luminosity with uh, 20 times more data. But still, you know, we are still a long way ahead. But before I conclude, on our way to Higgs self coupling, usually we search, uh, we look for the Higgs pairs in, in gluon gluon fusion because it's a, like it has larger cross section. But another very powerful probe for new physics is to focus on the vector boson fusion production. And it's particularly important because this gives unique access to the coupling between the two vector bosons and the two Higgs. 
So these are the main diagrams for VBS, for this is the vector body of fusion production. This has to do, this is the, the, the coupling between the vector boson and the Higgs. These are very well measured to, to five, six percent uh, current at LHC. The nice thing here, the important thing here is that this, if we assume standard model values, this, there is cancellation here, right? But, and this means that if you, even if you modify a little bit the coupling from the standard model value, this has a very striking effect on the kinematics. And here on the plot on the left, on the bottom left, this is the invariant mass of the two Higgses. The blue corresponds to the invariant, the distribution if we assume standard model values. But if you change just 20% of the coupling here, you see how striking this, uh, the effect is in the invariant mass of the two uh, Higgses. And this gets much higher values and this translates to high momentum uh, Higgs bosons. And for this, actually we carry out the same analysis, the same content, but of course we uh, want to, with some selection that exploits the characteristic uh, of the vector boson fusion topology, these forward jets here. And uh, this is an example actually of the, of the, of the shared fusion. So look, the y-axis is around 10, order of 10 events. So we managed to reduce the QCD that was 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, down to uh, less than 10 events. So with selections uh, on, the, on, the, on the tagging, on the jet front, on the event level. And this, of course, means that we have to, we put also a lot of effort to predict using data, directly data, this background. And the solid histogram, the predictions, black markers in the data, and the red one is uh, uh, a signal, uh, a signal uh, model, uh, which is particularly interesting, actually, and I will show you in, in a while. Yes. Yes. Because actually, uh, if you don't have the cancellation, this is a longitudinal component of the of the of the of the W's. I mean, if you go high uh, momentum, then you effectively you, you 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 if you don't have this cancellation, you violate, you violate the unitarity here, right? So that's why, you know, if this, uh, you change a little bit, this guy here has this drastic effect. This doesn't matter so much because going at high invariant masses of the Higgs, this is far off cell, so it, it contributes very little, right? This goes very much off cell, right? Because we are targeting this regime of two or three TeV. And we use these results to set limits on this coupling, this quadri coupling of two vector bosons and two Higgses. This shows on the, on the x-axis. But one thing I would like, these are, okay, these are the tightest constraints. This is the constraint, this is the allowed window here. This is the red one, is what is uh, uh, excluded by CMS. The blue one is from Atlas. But I would like actually to highlight this point here, these zeros. This means that actually, Kappa to V equals zero means that this coupling doesn't exist. And this point we, ex we exclude by more than six sigma, six standard deviations. So, and this is the first time this is excluded, but if you want to see it differently, this is the, actually the first com confirmation that the quadri coupling between two vector bosons and two Higgs exists. And um, yeah, this brings me to, to the summary. So uh, clearly, uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson was the highlight of the first 10 years of the LHC running and, and completes a very remarkable theory, the standard model of particle physics. And since then, we have put enormous progress, uh, pro progress uh, in understanding the Higgs uh, particle. The progress was both in experimental and also uh, theory uh, communities. And cutting edge technologies in several areas brought some substantial improvement in sensitivity often reaching or even exceeding the sensitivity that we were expecting at the end of the high luminosity LHC program with much, much more data. <coughs> Still, everything looks very standard model-like, but, you know, uh, a very 
famous person, gentleman, uh, made this statement at some point, and then, you know, special relativity is followed, etc. So we should not lose our hope, and we should start to continue exhaustively studying the energy regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, we have time for questions. Let me switch on the lights. So, Lucas, can, can you go back to the slide where you showed the branching ratios for HH decays? So, you, you made a, a good argument for why the higher branching ratios live with at least one BB. But I can't, can't help by noticing that there are a couple ones that are over a percent that are perhaps more fleet, cleaner in terms of number of jets. Mm -hmm. For now, they're probably not interesting, yes. but will they be interesting in the high luminosity? With more luminosity, they have better signal purity, which, because you need, you know, it doesn't translate uh, to yeah. the but if we, with more data, the picture will change. Still, with extrapolation that we have done uh, at high luminosity LHC, using the results that I showed, 4B is one of the most uh, sensitive, but the BB gamma gamma is the most sensitive by LHC gamma. But this is, this shows up at the end of the high luminosity LHC. Other questions? So since everything performs better than expected, is there any chance we can ever measure the quartic Higgs coupling? So, actually, <laughs> there is, a, I'm, I'm not sure if to, to measure the quadric Higgs coupling, but actually there is recent, actually from postdocs here at Brown that we saw there's a very good complementarity if we simultaneously uh, go after the trilinear and the quadric uh, coupling. We're talking about the four Higgs, right, the vertex here. It can constrain, actually, uh, the much better the, um, uh, the limit you have in the, in the trilinear coupling. So to measure it, I think it's difficult, but I never know. But actually, it's, in, it's more important than we thought it is, actually. And this is work in, in progress we are doing. Yeah, it's a triple Higgs production. There's one diagram which is quartic, but there's 70 diagrams which are tri trilinear, so you get yes. a lot of extra. It looks very exciting. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Other questions? Not let's thank Lucas again. Thank you.